A room without books is like a body without a soul. Hello and welcome to Sundoku, the podcast for frenetic readers. I'm Kath Keneally. And I'm Annie Hastwell. And buckle up and hold on to your hats because we are heading into the arcane world of poetry today. I dispute whether it's so arcane, but we'll talk about that. Uh, we're going to be talking to two poets who work in collaboration. They are Ken Bolton and Peter Bukowski. They now have four books that they've written together. The two that they launched a few months ago at once are called On Luck Street and Waldo's Game. And they work together. They work together. Um, We'll wait to hear what they say about their methods, but it seems to work very well. The thing to know about these is that they're largely character-based. They're sort of portrait poems, so they're very, very accessible. And also later on I'll be talking to Mike Ladd, who is a well-known poet broadcaster. He was the founder of the Much Loved Poetica, on ABC Radio National, which unfortunately is no longer with us, but gave an incredible insight into poetry. And I'm talking to him about what it was like to actually grow up knowing that you wanted to be a poet. Yeah, I don't know how many kids <laughs> have that as their ambition when they're asked what they want to be, but obviously he's one. And I don't know what most parents would say if a kid said they wanted to be a poet, but his parents were amazing. You expect that they would reel back in shock and horror, but Apparently, well, we'll find out. That, that you think an arts be... degree is, is useless and is not <laughs> going to right. get you a job? What do you think about <laughs> That's being right, poet? being a poet. Mm, interesting. So, Annie, I'm getting the feeling that you don't, for preference, read a lot of poetry? Oh, I do, actually. I do. I read quite a lot, but it's all pretty old. I have never quite engaged with modern poetry. Mm. I'm quite addicted to, you know, Yeats and and. There are some poems that are so amazing, they're so powerful, there's this tightness and strength that carries an idea that will always relate to whatever that thing is. Like I'm thinking about W.H. Auden and Mm. Stop All the Clocks, Mm. or my very favourite is The Second Coming, Mm. um, which the centre cannot hold, which is all about political unrest and sort of once again is a completely perfect poem for our times. But yeah, I have found modern poetry a little bit difficult sometimes. It it just sometimes seems like it's a, this is going to sound really harsh, an unpunctuated brain dump. Yeah, that is harsh. Uh, some of it is. Some of it is and some of it's not very approachable at all. Um, but as somebody who writes it, I think <laughs> I think I write poems with stories uh, or, or at least following a line of thought is usually what happens to me and... Um, possibly too much so. I mean, I think a poem should be concentrated, compressed, a little bit different to prose and making language work hard. So, you know, a lot of modern poets do that. Those poems and those poets that you mentioned are the poets that we got fed at our most impressionable and that we drank in and they have stayed with us. And we've applied them to so many events in our lives now that they're going to be the things that seem like the the final word to us forever but of course if you were growing up now you know maybe a Taylor Swift song would do that for you and you'll you'll hold on to a lyric of hers for the rest of your life. Look you're totally right and I have been harsh enough of my Philistine views on poetry (laughs) I'm open-minded today I did go along to the launch of Ken and Peter's books and it was much appreciated, as you can hear here. In our poems, we're trying to create both image of people, of a scenario, and also a narrative. Peter Bukowski, Ken Bolton, have known each other for a very long time. I know this. And they've been writing poetry for a very long time, both of them for around about... 35, 40 years plus. I think Peter wrote his uh, as a very young guy and he has stuck assiduously to the calling all his life. And same with Ken. I think he started in his 20s. Anyway, um, I suspect that it was Peter's idea that they should have a go at uh, writing poems together and that he started sending Ken 
things of his that Ken responded to is my feeling. And now there are four books, and the two that were launched were on uh, when we were there were on Luck Street and Waldo's Game, but there are two others as well. You can go to the Wakefield Press website to find out more. Both of them, you know, you can find out a lot about. They're both very widely published and very well known by people who study the Australian poetry scene. So. Yeah. And I think this interview gives you an insight into, A, how their process works and how interesting it is, mm. but also we get to hear part of the stories. We do. I wrote a poem in which I wave to Ken while I'm driving a car in rural Australia. And I sent the poem to Ken and challenged him to write a response, which he did. It took him a while. And then I wrote a response to his response. And that happy call and response thing kept going and it's kept going through four books and we've had a lot of fun um, doing this. And you can respond directly with a reference to something in the prior poem or you can respond sort of tangentially. And Ken, uh, you've got form in this regard before. Yeah. You've got a long history of collaboration with uh, your partner in yeah. crime, John Jenkins. That's true. This is this is a different one, though. Uh, John and I write the poems together, and so there's a lot more argy-bargy about what goes into any specific poem because we've both got irons in the fire or whatever and you know, egos to solve, whereas Peter and I write the poems separately. We might give each other a lot of advice and critique once each one's done. But uh, each one of us sets the poem separately and the collaboration is really in the, the narrative that begins to develop uh, or the contrast in narrative genres and styles that are alluded to. One thing that's tying all of the books together is what you decided on as the sorts of poems that these would be. Well, there's common interests. Uh, there's an interest in, in music... Uh, whether it's jazz or blues or pop music. And then there's also an interest in crime fiction and more with Ken and me, uh, quite a good knowledge of a certain period of cinema. So there's some satire on all of those subjects or also some serious poems uh, on all of those subjects. And Pete, I know once upon a time you did a lot of portrait poems well, in a way, that's what these are? Yeah, I really enjoy creating fictitious characters. So there's not any uh, researched characters in the four books that Ken and I have done, but there's a lot of fictitious ones and uh, they're quite colourful. Portrait poems was the form that Peter wanted to go with and I could see that Unless I was going to keep writing the long philosophical poems that are basically about what I had for lunch, you know, what I think about my navel, I would have to match him. And so mine also became portrait poems. My people tend to do a lot more muddled philosophical thinking. And Peter's stories have a fair bit more narrative directly told, whereas mine is often implied or suggested. Hey, you've had an extremely colourful life of travel. Are any of your characters lifted out of your experience, experiences around the world? Certainly some of the landscapes are, are directly influenced by travels in rural Australia, but also by uh, North America. I fell in love with North American fiction, contemporary uh, starting with the Beat Generation, and there's certainly that sort of noir element. And uh, on the road, there's a lot of restlessness amongst the characters, which was the restlessness of the Beat Generation. And it gives the characters an opportunity to break out of uh, limitations. I went to the launch in Melbourne the other night, and you read a couple of poems about very ordinary people like Arnold. I wrote a couple of supermarket poems having personally worked in supermarkets part-time 
since uh, high school era and then even after high school I got some more full-time jobs in supermarkets and that had a lot to do with stocking shelves, working forklifts, supply chains, what we now call supply chains and moving pallets around. It was a surprise to me that that subject matter came back in poems but I treated it sort of very humorously. <laughs> you did, you got a lot of laughs. And I thought both of you did the very sympathetic female characters. I think you read one of yours, Ken. I think we've got a number of sympathetic female characters. Well, why not? Half the public world is female, or slightly more by percentage points. So there's a great mother and daughter, New York mother and daughter, that's a single mother, a lawyer, and a very smart daughter, and you get the mother's worries and concerns and just fondness for the daughter as she watches her walk to school or come back. And the daughter's concern for the mother and also respect and excitement about what she and the mother might do, you know, like they do educated, upper-middle-class sorts of activities. And then later on, the mother realises the girl that she's raised to be a perfect companion for herself is, of course, going to get a boyfriend. In fact, has got one too soon. He's Russian, he may not be as cultivated as, or well, he's differently cultivated from her, and the girl's going to go away and the mother worries about what she's going to do with the rest of her life. Good Lord, that's a lot to get into a poem. Mm. I got it in the, uh-huh. I did. Um, and, yeah, and then the one that you heard was a nurse that we mentioned early in the second book who um, is a little bit slighted or miffed maybe that a doctor doesn't pay much attention to her even though she's being terribly useful to him and he seems to be interested but then he isn't. And in the later poem you meet the same nurse taking over a a rest home probably, walks in and she realises she's met the same patient that she saved when that doctor was around 15 years ago, 10 years ago. And the woman has a talk to her and you realise what the nurse's career has been and what the woman's career was. These all sound like little novels, but in fact I think, Pete, that the art is in the conciseness of them and and knowing just where to end and leaving a trail of dots, as it were. Yes. Charles Bukowski said when writing a poem, get in, get out, don't linger. And I like the tightness and succinctness and directness of crime fiction, and that's even influenced the non-crime fiction poems and I'm thinking of contemporary people's uh, attention span you know they haven't don't seem to have much of an attention span these days so grab them and hold them and then show them a bit of variety smack them about the chops give them a little bit of a shake up on the back cover of uh, let's see on Luck Street the characters described in the poems are called connivers chances and charmers <laughs> that cover them well it says those trapped and those who would break free to what extent do any of us trust our luck yeah it kind of covers them but they're not all disadvantaged and losers there's a kind of arrogant artist who who thinks his career's in the doldrums and his boyfriend's going to leave him and things turn out for the better and you get to see them performing in front of other people you know in a very snooty but sort of aggressive way. I think there are all sorts of people in there. And you're right, they are kind of... They imply novels with beginnings and ends. And, and then again, some, the same characters often turn up again further along in the novel, and so implied is what's gone between. And uh, you never know whether you're going to see someone again. So I suppose when you come to the end of a poem, you think, well, I wonder what's going to happen to her. That's a reasonable question. You might meet that person again. Well, we're talking about... Waldo's Game and On Luck Street. Can I just get you to both read us one? In the northwest corner of the state, one dirt road, a scar from the air, a general store, cash register lit by candles when the power goes. Those who stop do so to ask for directions. Some buy a chocolate bar, to get the taste of local dust out of their mouths. There is a cemetery, 
tilted tombstones, Irish surnames, the odd Italian. People still kill for gold, but do it elsewhere. WrestleMania My right arm is about two-thirds extended, and Georgeson can push up, but not as easily as I can pull down. The crowd has grown quiet. A small one, this is a Wednesday night. Friday night, Saturday, if you got this same lull, it will be broken up by catcalls and loud noises. Even the ice cream guy would be heard. Chocolate hearts, cornettos. Tonight he has gone home. They have their eye on us, though, waiting for his arm to give. The ref keeps on the move, so as to suggest some drama. Up towards the light, more the closer you get to the incandescent source of it, insects, moths, I suppose, circle and flit and flutter, bright against the darkness. A cone of them, white and terrified, though calmness is what they communicate as they circle, humming, praying, dervishes do that, don't they? Anyway, the angle of my arm above my head, the bend at the elbow, reminds me suddenly of being at work at the ICI factory on that press. I laugh. I hear the cry that used to go around amongst the men when the foreman was needed. It was always sung in comic fashion. Bill Leslie, Bill Leslie, where are you? And the foreman would show up and a problem would be solved. Maybe it was the late afternoon light in the factory as closing time approached. Time here, pretty much, to bend Georgeson down to the canvas. He's heard me laugh and it's getting restive. He thinks it's him, of course. Shall I tell him about Bill Leslie? Ha <laughs> ha, there we go. Arm comes down. We rise. It's the end of the round. The crowd's amused cries register low-level excitement when the ref, Arthur Billingsley, is elbowed aside so Georgeson can give me a shove. I laugh again, shrug. Giorgio is not such a fool, usually. He's annoyed tonight. I'm thinking, though, Bill Leslie, Bill Leslie, where are you? It was 15 years ago. He was 30 then. I was 17. We made tool parts, I think, or machines for making tools. I didn't stay long and never cared to ask. I hardly care now. That was the last round. I'd lost count. I stand and Arthur raises my arm in the air. I look again at the moths. When the house, house lights come up, and now they do, they'll drop down from that height and consider their options, I guess. Flame worship, or a bit of a rest. Is self-immolation the best way out? I'll ask Georgeson if I see him, and duck. Ha <laughs> ha. Home to Mum. OK, this is book four. Are they going to go on indefinitely? One. We're going to give it a rest for a while, but we might bring up the subject, the possibility in 2024 but we both know that we're only going to do it if it intrigues us and if it's going to be fun to do and if so long as we don't repeat ourselves or rest on our laurels. The other thing is the publisher we were surprised that he wanted to do two books and then now there have been four although they've begun to sell very well if the last couple of launches or any indication so maybe the publisher will be keen yeah have you got other characters bobbing around in your head oh lots yeah yeah you've always got a few i've got lots at any rate um, i was thinking at one stage of you know philosopher grand prix drivers and mm. all sorts of stuff Pete? yeah i'm thinking of um bringing some in from my solo books to have cameos in our joint books so there's a um, hapless poet that I might bring in called Jacob Strangle <laughs> and so uh, we'll see what happens or meanwhile some completely new character will come in we've actually had aliens from different planets appear in the poems so it's kind of likely that They'll want to show up. The sky's the limit, in fact. The sky is... It's, it's, an, it's a uh, 
freedom to go wherever you want to go, and the freedom is an important part of it. Ken Bolton and Peter Bukowski at the launch of two of their books together on Luck Street and Waldo's Game. They're both Wakefield Press books. And now to a career poet, Mike Ladd. I spoke to Mike about his long association with poetry and he told me how early he started. Really, I think poetry began for me in infancy um, as an oral process. I remember my grandmother bathing me. This is one of my first memories. She was bathing me and sliding me back and forth in the bathtub and singing a little song to me, chanting a little chant. Swim, Sam, swim, swim across the dam, swim like a swan. And that sort of alliteration in that and the half rhymes in that, it combined with the swishing of the water, somehow that imprinted on me as a, a, you know, that here was a musical form of language. This wasn't normal speech. And even my early childhood reading of, of books, I remember my first book was called Why La the Cockatoo? And it talked about the cockatoo being hatched in a hollow branch, 60 swaying feet above the ground. Now that's prose, but it's also poetry, the way they use the, the metonymy of, of the 60 swaying feet above the ground. It's got a rhythm, it's got sound imagery in it. And alliteration. And alliteration. So for a child to be so, attracted by alliteration must have been quite unusual. Yeah, and so I don't know about... I've got a theory that poets have some kind of genetic attraction to that kind of language and they have a certain way of thinking and a certain way of being in the world and that imprinted on me very very early and I started trying to replicate it and I started hearing words in my head Um, I would look at things or experience something and it would translate into starting to hear these kind of little phrases in my head which I would write down so yeah my my first stuff my mum told me was you know eight or nine years old and she collected these little ditties and I started writing in school in in you know early high school and I guess some of the early influences there were those sort of anthologies we all got like you know mainly modern and the voices series and that kind of poetry and I started getting um poetry published when I was 15 in Youth Rights and The Weekend Australian. I got a a wonderful, very long rejection letter from Rodney Hall, who was editor of The Australian. I sent some poems to him and he, you know, it was a four page handwritten letter from a busy editor saying, beyond question, you have talent. You are a poet, which is a huge thing to hear when you're 16. Very interesting too. Do you think times have changed? Would it be as easy for a 15-year-old to to get their poetry noticed these days? Um, No. Well, they might get it online somewhere obscure, but um, not from a mainstream publication. Unfortunately, the way most poets hear about um, being rejected is they don't hear anything. Not a four-page, carefully worded Mm. letter analysing each poem and what was wrong with it, but what was good about it as well. You know, so that was a, a huge vote of confidence. And also at that very same age, my grandfather died and he was a, a closet poet and he had a um, wonderful collection of books that because my grandma knew I was starting to write poetry and getting it published, they came to me. She said, well, Michael should have these books. So I got a, inherited a whole couple of shelves of poetry books at 16 uh, mostly English canon, you know, <laughs> Wordsworth, <laughs> from Blake to Blake through to Yeats, but he had some modern stuff as well, like Yevtushenko in translation. So I started reading that stuff. I mean, I got a bit stuck on Byron. I didn't read the whole of Byron, but I love Blake. And so that was an early influence. And at, pretty soon after that, I heard about the Friendly Street poetry readings and went along there and, and began to be mentored by... Um, you know, some of the leading poets in Adelaide at the time, Kate Llewellyn, Andrew Taylor, Peter Goldsworthy, um, you know, mentoring by example, by hearing them read. So it was a combination of reading and an oral tradition that, 
that really set me on the course for poetry. As a poet, I would imagine you know anybody who loves words would be attracted to the idea of poetry, but, but often ends up writing. What's the difference to you in your mind about expressing yourself through poetry and expressing yourself through writing? Like, would you sit down to write a novel? Or? Through writing prose, you mean? Mm. Like, um, yeah. Um, look, I've tried a novel three or four times and abandoned it because I thought it was no good, <laughs> and I also. It's such a it's such a long process writing a novel. Poetry comes to me in different ways. I think it's it is freer in some ways. Um, it it starts really from for in my case. This is not the same for every poet, but it starts in my case from fairly immediate experiences, sensations, just feeling something that I want to explain to myself, and it'll start triggering words in my head. And I write them down and I don't necessarily know what I've got until I finish it on the page, you know. And I don't, I I sort of just start with those words and then see where it goes. So it's important to get that immediate mind, hand, writing connection to get those thoughts down before they disappear. That's right. It is. It's it's almost like trying to transcribe something before you lose it. Um, And so I'll dash things off in notebooks. But then it's actually a pretty meticulous process of editing, line by line, syllable by syllable. I'm actually really trying to hone it when, I'm, when I think I've got something that's worth something. Prose is a bit different. I'm often writing to a plan, incorporating research notes. I kind of know what I want to get across. Um, whereas with a poem, I actually I'm discovering something for myself on the page. So it's, it's freer, but it's also pretty tight on um, on the editing side as well so there's an initial freedom but there's also a discipline at the end because for me poetry is well not necessarily rule bound but you, you're looking for patterns you're looking for precision and you're looking for a, a real economy you know you try and get some of that into prose as well but it's it's even more magnified in poetry is that cultural difference between poetry or time difference too? I'm thinking of the sonnets and the very strict metre. Yeah. Digging out my memory now of school poetry. It seemed to, there seemed to be a lot of rules surrounding it. And then you look at Japanese poetry and the haiku, you know, the 17 syllables, yes. that sort of thing. So modern poetry seems a little bit more vague and free-flowing when I read it. Can you explain yeah. the difference there and whether rules are a good thing when it comes to a poetry form? Yeah, look. Look, traditionally, you would say that poetry is rule-based or pattern-based. I mean, it didn't always rhyme. Homer didn't rhyme, but it did have a hexameter, so six beats in a line, and that was quite strict. It's gone through various phases, um, you know, blank verse, like Milton Milton almost is a little bit more prosy, but then you've got the Shakespearean sonnets, very strict forms, Petrarchan sonnets. It is a, um, a kind of annotated musical form of language traditionally i guess in the uh, early 20th century a lot of that got thrown out by the modernists but even if you look at them they're still playing with patterns they're just fracturing them and breaking them up so it it's not ever done with just um, no respect for what's happening on on the page frost said that poetry without meter was like playing tennis with the net down (laughs) I don't necessarily agree with that but I I get where he's coming from and I think you have to be quite um, you still have to know what you're doing when when you when you're not going for a pattern do you think everybody in modern poetry does know what they're doing or do you think sometimes it's just stop the line here start a new line I mean sometimes when I'm reading some poetry which I don't enjoy it just seems like they just chop it into yeah bits chop it up yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't say everyone's <laughs> knowing exactly what they're doing. I'd say the good poets are very concerned about where that line stops and they've thought about it very hard. And also, uh, I wouldn't say that, um, you know, there is no rules-based poetry anymore. There's actually a lot of, you know, poet. My, my latest collection has a number of traditional forms in it, um, like Pantun, which is a four-line ABAB rhyme scheme. Malaysian form or the Jueju which is a traditional Chinese form and, and you know there's a number of that I've invented for myself like 
they have to have seven lines in each stanza and the second and seventh rhyme. That's not a traditional form, but it's just one that That's I imposed. That's the Mike Ladd form. That's the Mike Ladd form that I've just imposed on that particular poem um, because I found that form for it as I, as I went along. So occasionally I'll do things like that, and you'll see poets um, impose other kinds of patterns on their work, syllable counts or shape patterns. So why would they do that? What's, what's the reason? I think it's an aesthetic choice. They like the way it looks and feels. But sometimes the pattern is actually trying to replicate what they're talking about too. So, you know, uh, a poet like Earl Burney early in the 20th century was, you know, was writing, there's a great poem of his called Billboards. And it's very chopped up and there's just these lines coming in and out. And, and um, you realise what he's doing is actually replicating the those billboards flashing past a moving car. So the way they... They just, you know, so it's a, it's a kind of modernistic poem about what it's like driving on a highway in America in the 50s, you know. <laughs> so it's actually uh, replicating the mm. world. And I think also very contemporary poets are trying to replicate the, the kind of craziness of the online world, you know, as well. There's sort of random interruptions you get when you surf the net and, the, you know, the, the strange byway. So they sort of creating a, a pattern of, of interruptions and strange links and things like that. So, you know, there, there's often a method behind the madness. Mm. I always think haiku, the form of haiku is perfect for that moment of reflection, like because it's so strict and because yeah, it runs the way it does, it's, it seems perfect for any moment. You could sum up, careful with your 17 syllables, but, you know, you could yeah. sum up that moment without having to put too much form into it and you are putting form into it but you know what I mean what you're saying is bringing bringing the feeling yeah. in, onto the page yeah that's right and and um, I love the haiku uh, form um, I used it a little bit but um, there are some you know people who exclusively write that in Australia now um, and worldwide it's an ongoing tradition but yeah I mean I, I, I love the, the sort of the compression of the form and the fact that you say something about the human condition, usually through the natural world, without spelling it out. Mm. You know, a, a poet like Issa was a poet that I loved. Um, you know, it's just like um, uh, his his little haiku: uh, um, a a stick of wood, a grasshopper going down the stream, singing. And so it's like this. Wow, it's just describing a grasshopper floating down a stream on a stick of wood, but it's singing. And you think, it's really the human condition. It's you know? visual, but it's also really but quite it's emotional. Also, yes. We're all floating down mm. the stream on a stick of wood. And what can what else can we do but, but sing? Mm. <laughs> so where's poetry going now? Well, you know, I think it's um, surviving in small groups, really. In some ways, it's more marginalised than ever. You know, it doesn't get the publicity... And let's face it, literature has become more and more about marketing and there's just mountains of it. And a lot of it is kind of um, the big mainstream publishers don't touch poetry. It survives in, as Auden says, in the valley of its making. So I think poets recognise each other and they form small self-help groups. But I mean... It survives. It, it's, it, it will always survive, you know. It always has. It's, it's a very ancient art form and people just who love it preserve it and keep it going. I think that um, the, the sales of poetry in Australia are, are fairly dire. There are some bigger, more successful poets around the world, but they're fairly rare. What you see is, I think, lots of fractured little groups doing their own thing, following their own style. There is no one ruling world style. I mean, since since the modernist explosion in, in the early 20th century, I guess the dominant style would be a kind of supercharged, fragmented prose style, you know. There's lots of other people who follow different forms, you know, sound poetry, visual poetry, uh, new formalism, prose poetry, uh, the verse novel, there's a multiple, the haiku groups, there's a multiple number of these things. I wanted to ask you about slam poetry because that 
yeah. seemed to me when it came out to be a rather masculine co-opting of the poetry style. It was yeah. an angry, masculine, loud, and it yeah. seemed to me to go against what the heart of a lot of true poets. Well, I think it does in a lot of ways. I mean, that's that competitive form that was um, developed in America initially, you know, the winner gets the one that gets the loudest applause. In some ways that's very opposite to how a lot of poets think. However, I have, I have seen some good prose poetry. Uh, sorry, um, slam. I've been to some slam events. Uh, for example, Maxine Benaba Clark is uh, a terrific poet here in Australia and she often is in the slam scene. I saw her at a slam event. That said, I walked out of that event because there was an awful lot of what I'd call preachy, virtue signalling doggerel, just awful stuff. Slam is a is a kind of um, however gets numbers, so it is is an attractive form, I suppose, to um, especially younger poets. Um, what other trends would I say? The other big trend, I've seen a lot of trends in my career as a poet, you know, through through when I first started, the Americans were a big influence, the Ameri- sort of overthrowing the British model and to more experimental Americans. Then came feminism, then came postmodernism. Now I would say there is a real surge of what I call identity politics and poetics identity poetics so being trans being gay being muslim your, your gender race and sexuality is up front it's it's a really part of it mm. you know and i think there's good aspects to that and there's also some that maybe aren't so great like it's it's a bit um categorizing and if you don't fit the category well don't don't bother applying you know mm, that does apply right across the board to a lot of things now it does isn't it you need to yes, have an I, identity of some kind that's right and at, at its front and center mm. i mean your sexuality wasn't even asked about back then but you know when i first started but now it's sort of you know um i i a magazine the other day i was looking at was calling for submissions on queer eco poetry i'm thinking well what if you're a, <laughs> an, e- an eco-loving poet, but you're not queer? So it's like, don't, mm. you know, it's it's sort of a very much uh, central now. Which that, go- goes away from that idea of sharing a moment, which a poem, sharing a thought, sharing a moment with the rest of the world. I understand where it's coming from because a lot of these groups were underrepresented for a long time. Um, the other big trend and this was always there is i would call it the academization of poetry in that a lot of it is dominated by universities and creative writing courses and they almost every university all around the world's got a creative writing course so they're producing a lot of people writing poetry and promoting that amongst themselves and look universities always were a safe haven for poets that's where you could get a job as a poet so, <laughs> you know, that's that's always been the case. But I think it's increased even more now. Mm. Uh, and, um, yeah, so those, those are the sort of trends that I'm seeing in, yeah. in poetry. I would say, though, um, I can see that poetry has always had a place in oppressive cultures as a means of resistance. And so I would not be surprised if we see around the world lots of underground poetry that will will eventually bubble to the surface in places like Iran uh, and uh, Gaza and you know other places, Russia. Mm. These they've always had a very strong culture of poetry, actually, and I can see that that will be a home for poetry that, that that will rise up. I just wanted to ask you a thing about how one looks at a poem and we, you were talking about the acad- academization of poetry. I do remember at school hating the fact that we had to analyse poetry mm. like, because if you had a poem that you had absolutely loved, it seemed to ruin it. It seemed to be like pulling the alarm clock apart. Yeah. <laughs> yes, or, or, you know... So how do you feel about the study of poetry the animal in that way? while it's still alive. Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. And then yeah. it's dead. 
Yeah. Look, um, I think um, a good analysis can be quite enlightening. Um, you know, I recently um, read a, a, a very good analysis of T.S. Eliot's uh, The Wasteland and, and um, just finding some other elements of his psychology and what, what was happening at the time and, you know, the image of the drowned man and how he feared travelling by boat from him because there'd been the sinking of the Lusitania and all this kind of stuff, things that I hadn't picked up before. And, and so it can be very hallucinating, but... I think it can be deadening too. The, the first thing you should get from a poem is a feeling. It's, it's, you, should, you should feel something and get it before you necessarily rationalise the whole thing. And I think that's what you don't want to lose. Yeah. <laughs> it, and you've recently, that sort of makes me think of dreams too. And you right. know, that feeling you get when you wake up and you've just had a dream and yeah. there's something magic and elusive and then it slowly fades away you've recently written about dreams and your partner's done artworks to match them talk about that process a bit what was that yeah. like well interestingly that was a very rule-based process um, because I had this crazy dream where I was given a set of rules for writing this stuff which was to remember a phrase heard in the dream then describe what was happening in the dream and then see if you could relate any Thing from that to your waking life the next day and then Google the dream phrase. Now all of that came to me in the first dream. So they were a set of steps for writing um, and I decided I would follow them because it was quite fascinating. Things that started in the unconscious then led into discussions about all sorts of things in the world, you know, all kinds of things, politics, sex, you know, technology, all sorts of things that led on to. So, um, yeah, the book's called Dream Tetris. I thoroughly enjoyed that process because in, I'm in control of it once I'm writing the, the, the connections with waking life. But to begin with, I'm not in control of it at all. So it's a way of sort of harvesting things from the unconscious. And it's fun because you don't know what you're going to get. What did but, your parents think about you deciding to be a poet? You know, my parents were nurturers in that sense. I mean, some parents would try and discourage you straight away, but um, I was encouraged. Um, I remember I was just left high school and my, I went for a walk with Dad on, on Glenelg Jetty and he said, um, he said, what are you going to do? You know, what, what are your plans for life? And I said, oh, I'm thinking of joining the Foreign Service, of being a diplomat, you know. Mainly because I was just dreaming of travelling to foreign places. And Dad said, don't do that. You will not be able to say what you think. Be a writer. So that's pretty, pretty great. That's a very unusual <laughs> from a story dad. for those days. <laughs> it is. And, and I was encouraged. I mean, they had a good library at home. They bought me books. I was very encouraged to, to publish. Um, I suppose they worried about the precariousness of an income. And I did a degree in... in um, philosophy and English, majoring in as much poetry as I could, but I had no idea what job that would lead to. And initially it didn't. Um, but, you know, in the end, I got a job as a sound engineer at the ABC, but in the end, I eventually had a job as a poetry editor. And for 20 years, I was running a poetry show on mm. Radio National. So the degree finally came in, in handy and... I ended up making my living from poetry, my, not my own. <laughs> I was promoting other people and, you know, much more famous poets than me and poets from across the world and the best poetry in Australia. But it was, uh, I was working in the field of poetry, you know, so I <laughs> got there. <laughs> now, you, you were going to bring along to this interview a favourite poet, so I get a feeling for what, what yeah. you like and respect. Yeah, sure. All right, this is... Um, one of my favourite poets. I have many, many favourite poets. So, you know, um, it's sort of an impossible choice, really, to pick a favourite poem because I love poetry right back to the ancient Egyptians, you know. But this is by a woman called Wisława Szymborska, who was a Polish poet. She won the Nobel Prize in Literature. Uh, she lived through the Second World War and the communist era in, in Poland. I love her style and it's influenced me. I love her concrete imagery and simple words but 
very strong philosophy. And I thought this was a really timely poem, given what's going on in Ukraine and Gaza. And, and it's called The End and the Beginning. After every war, someone has to clean up. Things won't straighten themselves up after all. Someone has to push the rubble to the side of the road so the corpse-filled wagons can pass. Someone has to get mired in scum and ashes, sofa springs, splintered glass and bloody rags. Someone has to drag in a girder to prop up a wall. Someone has to glaze a window, rehang a door. Photogenic it's not and takes years. All the cameras have left for another war. We'll need the bridges back and new railway stations. Sleeves will go ragged from rolling them up. Someone, broom in hand, still recalls the way it was. Someone else listens and nods with unsevered head. But already there are those nearby starting to mill about who'll find it dull. From out of the bushes, sometimes someone still unearths rusted out arguments and carries them to the garbage pile. Those who knew what was going on here must make way for those who know little and less than little and finally as little as nothing. In the grass that has overgrown causes and effects, someone must be stretched out, blade of grass in his mouth, gazing at the clouds. So beautiful and so timely. It's brilliant, yeah, it's brilliant. And it's classic Shimborska in that in the end she's saying, you know, the real heroes are those who've got to repair the world. Often it's women too, I'd say, <laughs> you know, who, who have to actually repair and make and start life again. And peace will come. It's also a little bit double-edged at the end is that human beings tend to forget and then they do this, make the same mistakes again. But it's, I find it a beautiful poem and just so simple but so true. Uh, I, I, this is why she's one of my favourite poets. This is Sundoku, the podcast for those afflicted with that most civilised of afflictions, a book addiction. And let's go out with a poem from Mike Ladd. This one, I think anybody who stares at a screen for too much of their day will, and worries about the future will really relate to. It's a poem called Prove That You're a Human because I've spent a lot of time recently on, you know, filling in official forms on websites where you get this algorithm that you have to select the photo with a bus or a a crossing in it or something. And quite tricky sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tiny bit of a bicycle wheel in the corner and... So while the, the blue wheel was spinning, I'd, I started writing this poem. Um, and it, because it also brought up the idea of it's going to get harder and harder pr- to prove we're humans with the AI world. Anyway, it's called Prove That You Are a Human. The blue wheel goes round. Select all squares with crossings. This park looks familiar, and I had a bicycle just like that. I wonder where the motorbike rider is going. Maybe to his long-lost mother's house. They've only just found each other after a lifetime of separation. Select all squares with traffic lights. The woman sitting on the bench behind the stop sign, she's a refugee who spent years trying to prove she's human. Select all squares with clouds, including clouds with silver linings, and clouded judgments. Prove that you are a human. Do something lovely or vicious or both. Select all images with stairs. Heard about click farms where the poor hammer at keyboards for the designers of the bots? The young man going up those back stairs is on his way to one. To continue, type the characters you see in the picture. Those twisted cat scratchings look like my failed drafts. The blue wheel goes round and round. I'm not a robot. Please believe me.
This podcast is produced by four book addicts refusing treatment. Sarah Martin, Annie Hastwell, Michaela Andreev, and me, Kath Keneally. Our thanks to composer Quincy Grant for the music. If you want to find out more about the books and authors featured in this program, check out the show notes. And you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Sundoku Cast, which is T S U N D O K U Cast. <laughs>